Uh, I'd like to make introductions. First of all, I'm Warren Franke. I'm the Associate Chair of the Department of Kinesiology. Welcome to tonight's talk. Um, it's part of a series of lectures that were, have been offered through the Helen, <coughs> Helen LeBaron Hilton Chair Endowment. And as the name implies, this endowment was established through bequest by Dean Hilton. Let me tell you a, couple, a little thing, a few things about uh, Dean Hilton. Uh, Helen LeBaron Hilton served as Dean of the College of Home Economics from 1952 to 1975. And over the years, this college has become part of what is now known as the College of Human Sciences. And among many achievements, Dean Hilton was known as someone who felt that we in the college should help influence public policies and programs that affect families and their quality of life. And our speaker tonight exemplifies this attribute of Dean Hilton. Dean Hilton. Uh, Dr. Miriam Nelson is currently the director of the Sustainability Institute and deputy chief sustainability officer at the University of New Hampshire. And prior to that, she served as the associate dean of Tufts University's Tisch College of Civic Life and professor of nutrition at its Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy. And at the Friedman School, she was the founding director of the John Hancock Research Center on Physical Activity and Obesity Prevention and co-founder of Child Obesity 180. Dr. Nelson's contributed broadly to several health-related federal public policy initiatives. Uh, among many accomplishments, she served as the vice chair of the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She's also served on the 2010 and 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committees. And within the 2015 iteration, Dr. Nelson spearheaded the influential work on dietary uh, guidelines and sustainability. In addition, addition, she recently completed a term, including serving as chair, on the Science Board of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And so tonight, she'll engage us in the topic of strong women and men live well, nutrition and exercise for optimal health. So welcome, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Warren. Uh, I hope it's okay if I, I like to, it's hard to, I'm, I'm short getting me behind a podium. You'll only see from my nose up. And I also like to move around. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to, uh, and everybody can see me pretty well. I promise I'll sort of move and you can see me. Um, I understand that I'm competing tonight with a women's basketball game. Um, so I have to say I'm really impressed that you came. I hope that the students that are here are getting a lot of extra credit um, for tonight. And for those of you who aren't in school, I hope that you learn a little something. I, I hope with um, my talks that everybody leaves with some little nugget of information. Uh, I have to say a huge thank you for inviting me to campus. Uh, I have, I think, driven through Iowa, um, but I have never actually come to the campus here. And it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful day. We had a foot of snow in New Hampshire yesterday. We had another foot of snow today. I got out yesterday, barely. Um, and uh, it's really fun to be here and to get with, to meet with so many different people. And I do hope that the women win tonight. So um, what I would like to do is to talk a little bit about sort of typical aging versus optimal aging. I'm going to be following that with um, some information about the importance of strength training and balance training, especially as we grow older. Uh, and sort of what's going on? Why is it that we aren't very active as a population? Some sort of some of the background and some thinking around um, our physical activity and nutrition habits. And then I can't help myself, but as, as Warren said, um, I've done a lot of work in public policy around nutrition and physical activity. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about what should we be shooting for as individuals and as a population, and sort of where do we go from here. I'm going to speak, and then I'm happy to open up the floor. We can have a discussion and questions. If I didn't answer something in particular that you would like me to address, I'd be happy to do so. Um, in the uh, question and answer um, time. So when we think about physical activity, we know that it's important for people of all ages. And I will also say, 
genders as well. So sorry that I don't have a man up here. Most of my work has been in, in women's health. I promise I'll be showing a few photos of men. But um, what we see is that whether you are a child, whether you are a midlife woman or a younger woman, or whether you're an elderly woman like the woman on the right, Bernice, who was 93 when she first participated in one of my exercise studies. She took me bowling. She did beat me handily. Um, and it says not much about my bowling, but much more about hers. But it really is the fact that whatever age you are at right now is a great age to start being physically active if you haven't been. I've been um, interviewed a lot, and a lot of reporters will say to me, so what's the right age to start exercising? And I'll say, well, if you're two and you're a toddler and you want to move around, that's a good age. Or if you've just had a baby and you're postpartum, that's a fine age. But if you're 94 and you haven't been that active and you want to be as independent as possible, 94 is a good age. So it really is whatever age you are at, which is important to be physically active in some sort of way and certainly to eat well. So when we think about typical aging versus uh, optimal aging, I sort of like to put this photo, uh, this this slide up here, and and this isn't this is an incomplete list, I promise you. But when you think about inactivity, and what you see with inactivity, even if I took any of the students that are in here, and I made you completely sedentary, so you weren't walking across campus, you weren't moving around, we would see that your muscle mass would go down, your muscle strength, aerobic capacity, flexibility, bone density, balance, your fat mass would go up, you'd have glucose intolerance, depression, sleep problems. We see this also when we send people up into space and they aren't, the body isn't needing to move as much. This is really classic sort of inactivity. And the thing is, is that as you grow older, what happens is that these things naturally sort of catch up. And the reality is, is that if you are very active, I'm not going to say a 20-year-old, if they are very active, when they are 75 or 85 are going to be exactly the same. But what I will say is if you are active and you're 75 years of age or you're 85 years of age, you're going to be more like someone in their 40s who isn't active. So there is a real relativity here in terms of inactivity and aging. And they're very similar in terms of what they look like, but it shows you that if you are, are active, you can really help to slow these different biomarkers. Here's another um, more graphic way to describe this. Um, we used to do um, a lot of CT scans of the thigh. So this is a cross section of the thigh straight through here with a, um, on the left is a actually a 23 year old graduate student. It's a thigh um, midsection, the light gray is muscle, the white is bone and the dark gray around the outside is, is fat. The woman on the right is actually a 63-year-old woman, not active, um, but you can see that in fact there is about 45% uh, less muscle than in the person on the left. Um, I don't, I can show you, to see the differences when we, we took the woman on the right and we strength trained her and what we saw was about a, and I'll show this data in a minute, what we saw is about a, a 7 to 10% increase in muscle mass. It's hard to see it with um, the, the naked eye, um, but we use some technology to look at it. But you can sort of see that actually it's very different. So when somebody talks about wanting to firm up and it's not about losing the body fat. It's much more about making sure that your muscles are as strong as possible. Mm -hmm. Certainly body fat is something, but it's really the two together that make the difference. And similarly with bone, um, what we have on the left is trabecular bone of the spine. This is very strong bone on the left. You can see, you don't have to be a, a pathologist to see that the bone on the right is very osteoporotic. Um, interestingly enough, the bone on the left was of, I believe, was around a 67-year-old, and the bone on the right was a 53-year-old. Um, so, uh, and, and that had some metabolic issues. So, um, osteoporosis doesn't just affect uh, older people, it can also affect younger individuals as well. 
Um, I'm not going to focus much of my conversation tonight on obesity. I'm, I was asked to talk much more about bones and muscles, but I will say it's hard to talk about physical activity with not at least just putting some statistics up there. This is not a political map. Um, and what this shows you is that a, a good chunk of the population is over 30% um, obese. And with you can see that there are no states, and I have all these slides from back uh, over 20 years of, of slides, um, and I'll spare you that, where we used to go from light blue to dark blue, and now we go from yellow to red. So this has been a huge epidemic, and it's not just affecting um, midlife individuals, but it's also affecting children. Luckily with children, it's starting to come down from a number of different efforts that are happening across the country. Um, I won't be talking about that tonight, but I do feel like the, there, there is a trend that's happening, at least with children, so that this isn't such a big issue. Um, so a couple of just things to think about in terms of bone. We know through some studies, and I'll show you one of the first studies. I was lucky enough to have been one of the first to show the um, influence of strength training on bone. But we know from several studies that it is associated with strengthening your bones. And if you think about it, just think about the biomechanics. If you think about lifting a heavier weight, you're going to be stimulating those bone cells to be stronger and to adapt. So um, what we see with about two to three times per week of strength training of a bone density improvement of about one to two percent in midlife and older women. Now this is in contrast to people who are not active who are losing about two percent a year um, uh, with women after menopause. And it can be performed in centers, fitness centers, at home. There's a number of different ways to do the strength training. Um, I wanted to show you a study. This is one of my classic studies that I was um, fortunate to do. We published it uh, a number of years ago. Um, but it was a randomized controlled trial with women 50 to 70 years old. I used to think they were old um, back when I did this study, and now I could be one of these people in this study, so it, it's sort of caught up with me. Um, these were women that were not very active, and they were not on estrogen replacement therapy, and for a year, they strength trained twice a week, or they were a normal active, these women were working, they were normal active 50 to 70 year old women. And um, the strength training women came into our center, they did five exercises, they did, it was pretty high intensity strength training, very progressive. They started out slow and progressed up and uh, twice a week. Um, and then we measured them um, throughout at the beginning, in the middle, and the end. And I'll show you some of this data. So in terms of strength training, um, in terms of muscle strength, this is with a lat pull down. So we're getting at the upper back. And what you see with the, um, the, the, bla the blue here is that over time, even after 12 months, the women were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Interestingly enough, actually, we saw very, it's a non-significant change in the control group. In the other five exercises, they stayed about the same in muscle strength. I think some of this was just getting familiar with the exercise equipment, but big differences in strength. And we published this, we showed no plateauing of muscle strength, even after a year of high intensity strength training. Um, with muscle mass, so this is looking at literally the number of kilogram difference. The women who were strength training gained about one and a half kilos, about three pounds of muscle. And the women in the control group lost about a half a kilo or close to a pound of muscle, which is very, again, typical. With that dynamic balance, so this was their ability to do a tandem walk or to stand on one leg, so dynamic balance. The women who uh, were strength training, we didn't do any balance training with them, but they improved, sorry, they improved their balance, uh, sorry, um, they improved their balance by about 15% versus the controls balance um, was not as good after the year. In terms of bone density, in the, the hip bone and the spine was improved um, in terms of bone density by about 1%, whereas what's important here is that in the controls, they were losing between 1% and 3% in bone density. So a highly different, if you project this over time, you can see that it's very, very different. Um, 
there is data, not by myself, but from colleagues in Arizona that now have data of strength training in women over a decade. And what they show is that the women that are strength training don't lose any bone over time. They're able to maintain that bone. So this, these changes are long lasting. I wasn't able to do that. Um, we weren't able to follow these women for as long. <clears throat> in terms of physical activity, in terms of their going out and hiking and playing tennis, one woman took up rollerblading, which is not what I wanted her to do. I was worried about her having a fall. But these women became more active in their everyday lives. We see that once this physical strength comes into being, they just are more active and participating more in life. So they were about 30% um, more active versus the controls were less active. So what you're seeing here is a pattern of biomarkers where they are really reversing the aging process versus typical aging. So there's a lot that these individuals can do over time. And this was two days a week of about 45 minutes twice a week. Um, so in terms of balance training, I've done some other balance training exercises um, since that period of time. Um, we know that balance training actually really works for reducing falls, especially in individuals who are at risk for falls. And what you see is about a 30 to 40 percent reduction in falls in individuals who do balance training. And they can also be done at home. They can be doing a, in a center. I was part of a, a large national uh, multi-center trial that was multimodal. So they were walking. They were doing a little strength training and doing balance training. Balance training is really fun. It's one of the most resilient systems in the body. But you can dance. You can do Tai Chi. There are lots of different ways to do balance training that can be a lot of fun as well. Um, so here is a lovely lady, Helen. She's 91. And I show this photograph because I think that it's different now than it was even 20 years ago. But women have always been thought to sort of strength isn't something that you think of in terms of physicality. You might think of it in terms of their fortitude and um, everything else. But I think it's important to realize that women can be strong. Um, they can participate in strength training. It's not taboo. Um, and in fact, it can be really social and, uh, and a blast. My favorite part of this photograph are these guys here and their disbelief in what she's lifting. Um, you know, so she's a pretty, pretty strong lady. And then I love this um, John Turner. He's 67 here. There's um, quite a few photographs of him. And what we see, again, is sort of it's what you do that matters um, versus, and it's not really what you did when you were, sorry, um, the students in the room, it's not what you did when you were 21. It's sort of what you do all along the way that really matters and that you, you stick with it over time. So it's important to realize that you can still be, you know, pretty darn much of a hunk at 67 years of age. So. Um, so how active are we as a population? I want to sort of shift away from the sort of clinical um, trials and look at from a population standpoint. So this was some data that we were looking at when we were developing the physical activity guidelines for Americans. And it's pretty dismal. Um, and it's dismal because if you look, these are national data. These are girls that are 6 to 11 years of age. And I'll show you um, in just a minute. I think I have the men's. Uh, I do, just a second. So um, in girls 6 to 11, you can see on any daily basis, they're accumulating around 70 to 80 minutes a day. So this is 6 to 11-year-olds. Uh, this is with um, accelerometers. So this, the children are actually wearing something that's measuring it. So this is through the whole day. But look at this major shift that happens um, for the for when girls grow through adolescence and then at every different age category, it goes down. So this is a woman 70 years of age and older. And you can see that she's getting less than 10 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity on, on a daily basis. And this is counting all exercise from the time people wake up until the time that they go to bed. So we need to think in a much broader scale about how we get people to be more physically active. What we see 
with meeting guidelines with men, you can see the data is, is pretty much exactly the same as with girls, um, men and women, uh, sorry, um, uh, boys and girls, it's pretty, mimics it except for the, the males are all just a step higher at every age range. So about 8% of teenagers are getting the recommendation for physical activity, whereas only about 3% by using um, data that is by objective measure. Now, if I go and I ask you by self-report, and I must say the, the, the questionnaires have gotten better, but if I ask you how active you are, everybody over-reports how active they are. And ironically, they also underreport how much they eat. So um, it's really interesting sort of the psychology that goes into this. But the data is pretty dismal in terms of, as a population, how inactive we are. So why is this? You can imagine that if you really start to think about why are we so inactive, what you see is some huge demographic shifts in sort of how we live our lives. Well, in fact, leisure activity, and leisure activity is stuff where I plan, I go, I put my shoes on, I go for a run, or I do a bike ride, or I go to the gym. The leisure activity, probably as a population, we've gone up just a little bit, or we're about the same. But what we see is that the way we work in terms of occupation, we, very few people participate, um, or very much fewer people participate in manual labor on a daily basis as used to. So occupational activity has gone down. We used to transport ourselves much more by our feet, by bicycle, um, but now everybody drives. So transportation activity is gone. Household activity, how we rake our leaves is different than how we used to rake our leaves. And, and just um, the way we mow our lawns is different and how we bake our bread is different. So everything that's happening within the house, we are actually expending less energy. And sedentary activity has gone way up. The average household has a television on in their house about six hours a day. And the average individual is watching television about three and a half, these are averages, about three and a half hours a day. And um, a study was done with one-year-olds in New York and what they saw was that the one-year-olds were watching television anywhere from two to five hours a day. Um, and one of the most important things you can do as a parent, and even for adults, is not to have a television in the bedroom. Um, we know with children that it really creates really poor habits. It creates bad food habits, sleep habits, and we know with older adults and midlife adults also having a television in the bedroom also contributes to poor sleep habits as well. So you can see what happens, you get a new television, you take the old one, you put it in the kid's bedroom, so it's easy, but it's much better to try to really limit um, where the televisions are. But sedentary activity has gone way up, and now it's so different now because of screen time and the way we use screens, so it's a whole hodgepodge right now. So, something somewhere went terribly wrong. I mean, we used to be really active, and we are built to be active beings. And in fact, our brains work best when we are really active, and in fact, appetite regulation and everything works better when we are really active. And what's happening right now is we probably aren't even participating in a threshold on average where our body systems can operate really well because we are so inactive. So we really have shifted um, the way that we live our lives and our environments are really not built for us to be active. We, um, maybe not so much in, in Ames, but at least on the East Coast in Boston, um, we can spend pretty much a couple hours a day in a traffic jam. Um, we can take people movers, and I believe that we need to make sure that we make buildings and airports accessible for people with disabilities. But when you see that stairs in the middle of the escalator, take the stairs. I mean, any time that you are moving, um, it's going to be helping you. Um, and as we just talked about, there's so much screen time right now, and it's not just televisions anymore. So we are really... Um, 
our environments are in collusion to make sure that we are really inactive. So it's, it's tough to be active these days. But um, there are so many different ways to be active, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, this is uh, one of my um, studies that we did with a walking study with midlife and older women, and this was in the Boston Commons on a, a lovely spring day. So what about food? The American diet, what I would say is the way I would describe it is more. That's what the American diet is. And if you think about any grocery store almost anywhere in the United States, what you're going to see is, it, is it aisles that look like this. So what do you see when you look down this aisle? What do you see? What do you see? Calories, salt, sugar, snacks, fat. You see fat. A lot of, I mean, with my new work, a lot of plastic, a lot of colors. Um, but pretty much this aisle and most of the internal aisles, with the exception of where canned beans are and maybe some pasta and things like that, but pretty much all the aisles are sugar, fat, refined grains. Refined grains are the largest contributor of calories um, to our diet. You're going to see sugar. You're going to see uh, refined grains, salt, and sugar. And, uh, and so we have a lot of calories. And... We also have the cheapest calories anywhere. And obviously, what we see also is that the cheapest calories are usually the most unhealthy as well. We have a lot of added sugars. We have a lot of refined grains, a lot of sodium. So no wonder it's hard to go to the grocery store um, and come out of there without you know, a whole bunch of stuff. So how many teaspoons of added sugar does the average woman in her 20s Get each day from food. Anybody know? Any guesses? I heard 25. Well, it's about 24 teaspoons. Pretty good. Um, I should have brought a little glass, but um, if you, this is, um, actually, this is pretty good. That's about, uh, that's just a little over 24 teaspoons, but that's about how much added sugar a 20-year-old. Now, 25-year-old um, men are getting around 35 teaspoons a day of added sugars, and we're getting about two, three and a half tablespoons of solid fat, you know, hydrogenated fats a day as well. So this is, for the, for the average American, it's about 35% um, of calories is coming either from sugar or from saturated fat. So I... I have to say, and I, I hope you guys are okay with that, but I mean, I love butter. I mean, who doesn't love butter? And But I also make sure I'm getting olive oil and some other kinds of oils. I don't just have butter. Um, and uh, I also make sure that I try not to eat a lot of processed foods that are going to have a lot of different kinds of oils that might not be so healthy for me. So what I would say is the way that we eat is really complicated. And I won't go too far here, but just to say that individual food intake, I would love to be able to say, okay, Joey or Sam or Samantha, you need to eat five fruits and vegetables a day, some whole grains, some good quality proteins, and none of the other stuff that we all know about out there. And just that's what you should eat. I, should doesn't work in this. It's not the way that we eat. It's, food is deeply cultural. It's really related to our food environment. I was with wonderful grad students that I see some of them here right now earlier today, and I was saying I, I've moved four times in the last 10 years, and I eat really differently because of where I live. It's really interesting because it's what grocery stores are near me. It's um, uh, how, what kind of restaurants. I lived in center of Boston for a couple years, and I have to say I ate out all the time. It was not a good thing for my pocketbook nor my waist. So, um, so it really depends on... There's, um, there's your environment, there's your home environment, your work environment, the community you live in, the genetics that you got, and national policies really also affect culture, and there's marketing, um, there's the private sector, all of these things conspire to create a food environment that you live in wherever you might be living. Um, so 
what are the targets that we should be shooting for in terms of good nutrition and physical activity? I'm going to say right off the bat, the physical activity is easier um, because physical activity has a, a few less constraints in it. Nutrition is just a wide swath, and so it's really hard. People want, to, want me to say to them, what should I eat? And you know what? I can't tell somebody exactly what to eat. I mean, it depends on what you like. It depends on how you were raised. What's your, what's your background? Um, it, there's so many different parameters, so that's why the nutrition part is really hard. But let's, I'm going to talk just about some sort of overarching guidelines around nutrition. And what we know is that most people, not everybody, but most people need to eat a few less calories. We need to shift towards more plant-based foods. We eat too much meat as a society. We know that eating too much red meat, actually, while red meat has a lot of important nutrients, eating too much red meat puts you at risk for heart disease and different kinds of cancer. Um, so I'm not saying you need to become a vegetarian. We just need to eat smaller portions, less frequently. Um, really important, we need to eat more um, and we need to be more fruits and vegetables. So we need to dramatically reduce added sugars and solid fats and refined grains and sodium. Again, refined grains, it's the largest contributor of calories. Um, we get way too many refined grains and very few whole grains. And we need to meet the physical activity guidelines. The, there'll be new guidelines coming out in 2020. Um, I don't think they'll change dramatically. I hope that they just have more information. And also, we weren't able in 2008 to look at low levels of physical activity. I think there's going to be, there's a lot of benefit for just low levels and also the risks of being sedentary. Um, what about vitamins and supplements? Well, if you're reading any ads, you would think you need to take this supplement and that supplement and every other kind of supplement. And I have to just tell you that unless you have a nutritional deficiency or there's a, a medical issue that you're dealing with, I, there's really not much efficacy for taking multivitamin supplements. I don't think they're harmful to people. I think they just, the, the more well-nourished people are usually the ones that are taking supplements, um, which is usually the case. There's one exception. Are there a couple of exceptions? Um, but vitamin D, um, even in a beautiful day like today, um, it's, we're in February, even though the sun was shining bright, because of the angle of the sun's rays, we're making very little vitamin D. And so I really think that vitamin D is an important nutrient. We also just don't spend as much time outside, even in the summer months, and then um, we're not getting very much vitamin D um, um, from food anyway, unless we're drinking milk. Um, so I do believe, and I, I myself take vitamin D um, supplements. I think it's important. I think it's important um, to get your blood levels measured um, at some point in time so you understand where you are, but it's very seasonal, so you're best to um, have them, like this time of year would be this or, or March, uh, is a really good time before the sun's, sun comes back up in the sky. It's going to be your lowest level is right about this time of year. But um, vitamin D is very important for your muscles as well as your bone and your immune system. Um, certainly, there are some people who become anemic and need to have a bit more iron. Um, but otherwise, I, I'm, I'm just, there's nothing that beats fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and, um, and lean proteins and some oils to really get the, the vitamins and minerals that you are meant to get. What about coffee? Um, so in the 2015 Dietary Guidelines, um, my subcommittee that I led, we decided to look at caffeine and as a food safety issue. And the reason being is you go into any convenience store and you see Red Bull and Shot Blocks and, I mean, or I can't, I don't even know what the names of all these things are, five-hour energy drinks and all of these caffeinated, highly caffeinated beverages. And so we decided to look at that. And what we saw was we decided we couldn't just look at caffeine itself. We really also needed to look at the largest purveyor of caffeine, which is coffee. And lo and behold, 
what we saw was that having two, three, four cups of coffee a day, not, I'm talking about that size, not, you know, ventes, um, but having a couple of cups of coffee a day is actually really health promoting. Um, helps to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, helps with some neuro neurological issues. Um, the thing with coffee, though, is the implication here is it's coffee, but you got to be careful that you're not adding five hazelnut shots and a lot of uh, cream and sugar. We're talking about coffee in its rawest sense. So coffee is actually really health promoting. We didn't have enough data to look at tea. I'm a tea drinker, so, um, but I, but think about it. Coffee is a bean, right? So, um, no wonder there's lots of antioxidants and good things in coffee. So coffee's good for you. Not good when you're adding just caffeine, um, and alcohol together. Um, because a caffeine masks the problems of uh, alcohol and can really be a nightmare, especially for adolescents and younger adults. So um, caffeine with alcohol is not a good combination. Um, speaking of alcohol, uh, what we know for those who are um, of drinking age and above uh, is that in fact also alcohol, one drink a day for women if they like to drink, um, two for men, we're talking about um, a glass of, of wine or a bottle of beer or one spirit, but we do know that alcohol is also health promoting. But this is one of these things where if you don't drink and you don't like to drink, it's not like you should start drinking because it's a health food. Um, I wouldn't, that's not the right thing to be doing. But we do know um, that, that alcohol is very health promoting um, if you like to drink. But we do know that binge drinking or drinking more than one drink a day for women or more than two for men is um, not healthy. Uh, whole grains. Um, this is a shot. I did a, a really wonderful project across the country in rural communities. Um, and this was in um, Mazama, Washington at a ancient grain farm um, where they grow emmer. This is uh, Sam and Brooke Lucy and my assistant, um, Eleanor. And we, I really believe in whole grains. I think grains are one of these really interesting foods right now. I mean, everything is gluten free and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about the gluten free thing, but I will tell you what I believe is happening is that I truly do think there is a, a, a an autoimmune response to us as Americans, and it's not just Americans, but in developing countries, we're eating s twice as many grains, servings of grains a day than we ever did before. So we're eating tons of refined grains. The way they're processed, the way they're stored is really difficult for us. The con um, conventional wheat, um, is, has been really genetically modified in a non-GMO way, but it's really 10,000 years it's been changed. So the genetic makeup of wheat is very different than ancient wheat is. The farro, the spelt, um, things that we used to eat. So I think what's happening is it's just an overload on the system. And so it's why I believe that, um, and the data is starting to show that when people really reduce the amount of wheat that they're taking in, um, that they actually feel better, and I think this is related to all of this. What I worry about is now there are so many products that are gluten-free um, that it's they're not all that wholesome, and it's kind of what happened with the low-fat diets, and they just added a lot of carbohydrates to cookies instead of, and so they weren't very healthy. So it's really about foods that matter m most, and so I think that the reducing refined grains is really health promoting and increasing the whole grains is health promoting, but it's not happening on a national basis by any means. Um, think about your palate. The pattern that you're eating should be colorful. I know that not everybody likes their fruits and vegetables, but even if there are one or two that you like, I think it's really important to try to embrace those and think of the colors. Think about eating seasonally. Um, think about, um, uh, you know, it's, I, the, the m potatoes are the single uh, largest um, uh, vegetable eaten in the country. Um, unfortunately, most of those potatoes are in french fries form. So I 
Don't count a French fries as a vegetable, even though it is categorized that by USDA. But I think a good old fashioned baked potato. Potatoes are wonderful. Every vegetable. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think there's a bad one out there. I just. I think vegetables and fruits are just fabulous. Um, and healthy proteins. You don't have to be a vegetarian to eat well. Um, in fact, I think when you're a vegetarian or vegan, you have to be more thoughtful. And I can tell you, I've seen plenty of vegetarians or vegans that are eating atrociously. Um, you know, it's just bagels all day long or something else. So um, it's really about that mixture of different foods, but um, wholesome, good proteins are where it's all at. I am a meat eater. Myself, we have cows in, um, I, I live on a diversified organic farm in New Hampshire and we don't have a lot of cows, we have a few cows. Um, and I call myself a Tomitarian because um, my brother-in-law is the farmer and his name is Tom. And so I eat his meat um, and so I'm a Tomitarian. Uh, and I also think it's kind of let the planet be your guide. It's like what was grown, look at what's grown and think about what's grown um, was indigenous to where you grew up and that really helps you to eat really well. And I also think that food is very social, it's very cultural. The more that we can sit at a table as opposed to our desk or in our car, the more that we can cook meals, and I know I'm going back in time, but it's coming back, the more that we can have conversation. Um, this is where I really think you really build so much in terms of um, family knowledge and values, and, and it's really about instilling culture. But I really, there's nothing in my life that I love more than that family meal or a meal with friends around a table. So what about physical activity um, in terms of guidelines? You'll probably recognize somebody in this picture. Um, and I did, when we released the, the physical activity guidelines, I got to go to the White House, which was really a wonderful um, thing to be able to do. Um, there was also, we went with the Olympians. This was right after the Beijing Olympics. And you'll see another gentleman right here you might recognize as too. Um, but it was really amazing. We went with the Special Olympics as well as the um, other Olympians to the White House to launch the physical activity guidelines. It was a big ceremony. And it was a really, it's always special. And I, I was lucky enough also in the last administration to, to be able to go to the White House a number of times with the First Lady's Let's Move campaign, which was really um, a lot of fun. So what are we shooting for in terms of physical activity? This looks really simple, and there are many ways to get it. But with physical activity with children, we want children to be active one hour a day, at least playing, having a good time, a mixture of moderate and vigorous activities with adults. It's 150 minutes accumulated over the course of a week of moderate activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity or a combination of the two and two, week, uh, two times a week of some strengthening exercises. Um, before 2008, the guidelines was 30 minutes every day, pretty much five days a week to, to every day. And when we really looked at the data, the data said to us, that it wasn't about every day. While we would love for people to be active every day, it was more about on a weekly basis that people are active. As a working mom, I had three kids, um, they're grown now, but still it's hard to be active every single day. I'm traveling, I'm working. So, but it's, it's wonderful that in fact the data demonstrates you could go out for a hike on a weekend and you could get your physical activity guidelines. You can go for a bicycle ride one day, go play tennis another day, and you're gonna meet the physical activity guidelines. So it's, this is the base level, I'm not saying it's the optimal level. And we know that more exercise is also helpful, not an unlimited amount of more exercise. But, um, so there are many, many different ways to get your physical activity. Um, for older adults, you should be following the guidelines I just showed you for adults, but for individuals who are at risk for falls, they should be doing some balance exercises. And you also don't need to have medical clearance to go become, take a walk or become physically active. In fact, this was sort of a vestige from way back when, when there was this sense that before you become active, you gotta get your doctor's permission. In 2008, we joked, but we were kind of serious. We actually thought you needed to talk to your doctor to get permission for you to be sedentary. 
Um, because it was way riskier for you to be sedentary than it is for you to go out and take a walk and become more active. I'm not saying if you don't, if you have a medical condition, you, you should make sure you have a very good physician who knows what you're doing and can help to guide you. But there's also exercise physiologists, there's physical tr uh, uh, trainers, there's a whole plethora of wonderful professionals that can help you. And there's lots of wonderful community programs as well. So optimal prescription, an active lifestyle, gardening, chopping wood, going out for that stroll, all the things that you like to do, dancing, all of those things, being active, some balance exercises, some strength training, and aerobic activity is really what are the keys to health and longevity along with good nutrition. So key messages, any activity is better than none at every age. More is better. You want to accumulate activity in small bouts or large bouts. It doesn't matter, but even just walking up a couple flights of stairs matters. Walking is a universally great exercise, and most of us can walk, and so we need to get people participating more in walking. At any body weight, so if a person is overweight or obese, at any age, that person is going to be healthier than if they are not physically active. So it's really important for people at every age, at every body weight level to be active. And I think we sometimes over-medicalize it, um, but it should be enjoyable. You should have fun. You should like it. You might not like it right at the get-go because it's unfamiliar and uncomfortable, but over time, hopefully, you're going to really enjoy it. So having fun, as you can see, Loretta here on the right, she's having a great time. She set one of, uh, one of I think, the, the U.S. record for the 5K for over 80, so pretty amazing lady. Um, I've been fortunate enough with my work. We have a national program called the Strongman Program. It's operating in about 10 states. A, 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 a large program in Alaska, um, Oregon, uh, Kansas, Montana, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. I'm not sure why we're not in Iowa, but we're going to work on it. Um, but this, this is a group of ladies. It's a strength training program and a heart health program for women. And this is a group of women in Soldotna, Alaska, um, one of our longest running programs. I wouldn't want to mess with her. Um, uh, and, but these ladies are just fabulous. They're just wonderful. So where, where do we go from here? Like, is this, is this, um, can we figure out, like, what's the path forward? And I'm going to say, I don't exactly know what the path forward is, except to say that there are a lot of, young people in this room that are studying this, you guys are going to think even more creatively than all of us have. And I think that we, um, we're going to come up with lots of great solutions that help on a population basis so that we can be more active and not have all the issues that we've had in the last 20 years with inactivity. But we're also going to be thinking of even more customized medicine for individuals with different health conditions to help them reach their optimal health. And is it worth the effort? Yes, I think the older we get, the more we have to gain by being active and eating well. Um, I really think that uh, it's worth it. And it's not just physical health, but it's emotional and mental health as well. And I'm going to stop there and just do one last photo of me jumping off a cliff, which is what I usually do um, in so many situations in my life, and just say it's been a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the question is, that's interesting. I, I love, I love, I'm not going to call the coconut oil thing a fad, but coconut oil is really big right now. Um, coconut oil, it's a very saturated fat. Um, it's a wonderful fat to cook with. It, it has a lot of great properties. And so, um, what I would say is, but it also has some decent oils that are in it. It's a, it's an interesting mix, is that, I wouldn't use it as my sole like oil. I mean, if you like to cook with it a little bit, use it, but use, make sure you're mixing and using different kinds of oils. Also make sure you 
keep it refrigerated is generally better because it can go rancid. Um, so it's more, I think, with the oils, you want to have a mixture. And it's, it's a saturated fat. I just, I, I, don't, I don't think it's any worse or necessarily, I don't think it's a magic oil. Um, but I'm not going to say I think it's also uh, really detrimental for your health either. either. So, yeah, other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we did um, for that study, um, and I should, I, I don't mean to be self promoting, but the, I did write 10 books in the Strong Women series. Um, and five of them were New York Times bestsellers, and one of them has the pretty much the Strong Women Stay Young, which is here. Um, it's a small little book, um, and uh, we for that study, um, we did a we did a double leg press. So you're um, you're in a seated and you're pushing both legs out. We did a knee extension. So you're seated and you're extending your knee out. We did a lat pull down to get at your upper back. We did a back extension, so you're like this, and you're going backwards, so we did a back extension. And we also did a um, press forward. Um, so we did just five exercises at a high intensity, but we started low and worked up slowly. Uh, and um, I am going to tell you that I don't think there was any there was magic in our prescription, but you, you, it's, it was more about the large muscle groups and being upper body and lower body and trunk that mattered. So there's lots of different ways. And, um, and I do think machines are great, especially for older folks, because it helps to put them in position. Um, but there are different ways to do the strength training as well. Yeah. Um, did we experience a lot of dropouts in that study? We did not. I think we had uh, uh, one person dropout. Um, we were so nice. <laughs> um, we, our graduate students that were doing the program, I mean, they were just wonderful people. You know, exercise should be fun and it should be social. Um, we were serious. Um, but we, I'd have to look, but I think we had like one dropout. Um, they only had to come in twice a week. Um, and the control group just had to come in like every three or four months, not very often as well. So, um, and they were, it's like they had a personal trainer. I mean, it was a pretty wonderful pro program for these people. Um, our exercise studies, you know, we will see, depending on the length of time, but up to, up for like a two-year study, we'll see maybe five to like six, seven percent dropout rates. A lot of it depends on, you know, this was in downtown Boston, really hard to get to for older individuals, so we had to figure out transportation and things like that. So a lot of it sort of depends on it should be convenient, so we then would start to go out and go into people's homes or go to community centers and make it more convenient. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. What are the guidelines for protein per day? For, for protein per day, oh boy, now you're really testing me. Um, it, it's roughly 0.75, oh gosh, is there a nutrition? I think it's 0.8 grams per day, is it right? 0.8? Per 0.8 per day per kilogram of body weight. So you can sort of roughly transcribe that to one gram of protein per, gram of, uh, per kilogram of body weight is the easy math. Um, and uh, that's a, a healthy amount. Now, we did in this laboratory, I didn't lead any of the studies, the laboratory where I did a lot of the strength training work, we did a lot of protein studies and looking at protein balance. If we gave 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram, would we have greater muscle mass increases? No, we didn't. Um, uh, what we see is that around you know, 0.81 to 1.2 grams is plenty. And in fact, what we saw, not to get too technical, but what we saw was that when midlife and older people strength trained, they actually were more 
their protein balance improved. So for the amount of protein that they took in, their absorption, their um, protein uh, uh, generation was better. So in fact, they did better on the protein um, than uh, when they weren't strength training. So yeah, I'm not, I just, uh, I don't think there's a ton of data that taking mega amounts of protein really makes a big difference. I think it's hard on your kidneys too. Um, I will say one thing that I didn't say, and that is um, I'm just saying that I don't really believe that there's one amount of protein, carbohydrates, or, or fat that's like, we talk about high fat diets and low fat diets and hard, uh, high carb diets, low fat diets. Protein's pretty stable, but I'm going to tell you, you can eat really well on a high fat diet, low carbohydrate. You can also eat really poorly. You can also eat really well on a high carb, low fat and eat really poorly. So it's more, what are the kinds of foods that are making that up than, um, I just am not, I, I'm not a nutrient person, I'm a food person. So that's where my bias is coming from. Other questions? Yeah. Has there been a positive effect of putting trans fats on food labels? Yeah, well, okay, this is a real can of worms that you're asking about. Um, but this is so, it shows the power of labeling and things like that um, when we know that trans fats, which are basically like a saturated fat and contribute to heart disease. Um, so, and they are, there are some natural trans fats in food, but it's mostly primarily manufactured. So they put it, the, um, we put it on the nutrition facts label. And as soon as you do that, the consumer knows how much trans fats in there. So companies stop putting trans fats in most of the foods. But what they did was, Sorry, this is getting in my new world. They, they then cut down all the forests and grew, um, so there was no habitat for orangutans and things like that, and grew palm kernel oil, which palm kernel oil is not a trans fat, but it's also a really unhealthy fat. So we substituted palm kernel, uh, uh, the, we took out the trans fat and added palm kernel oil because it was cheap. And so, so we don't, we're not eating much trans fat anymore in the diet. With some, there's some, but it's not much anymore. But I don't believe that what we've, we've substituted it with, what the manufacturers have substituted with has been an environmental nightmare. And also I don't think it's really contributed personally much to Americans' health because of the way we've substituted it. So it's a complicated answer. So. Yeah, it's really fascinating. That's why we have to be really careful about unintended consequences with some of the policies that we come up because we may not be thinking about other things that can happen. But great question. I will say, we're right now we're, I don't know, I, I think it's gonna happen, but we have a new nutrition facts label that's going to have added sugar. So right now you have to, pretty much have a PhD or be a dietitian in nutrition to understand how much added sugar is in your foods that you're eating. It's pretty hard to figure that out. Um, but now with the nutrition facts label, it will have added sugar. And we're, we are, there are some worries about unintended consequence. I, I am a big proponent of having added sugar on the label, but we have to be careful we aren't substituting then for sweetness with something else and, it, it's kind of interesting, so, yeah. How much vitamin D, I take, I actually take 2,000 international units a day. Um, I, I've had my blood levels checked, they're, they're regular, they're normal, so I feel good about it. Um, I, it's not too much. Um, we used to think there was a, a, a much lower upper limit for vitamin, vitamin D, but it doesn't seem to be the case, so, but, um, I think around 800 to a, you know, to 2,000 is, is a decent level. But I think it's important that you get them measured here and there. We did a study, just finished at Tufts with um, elementary school kids, low income, very diverse, and about 25 to 30% of them had clinically low vitamin D levels. So um, this is, I mean, it's, it's tough to see it, especially in kids when they're growing. So other questions?
Oh gosh, now you're getting, I'm, my biochemistry is, we've got, we must have some nutritionists in here. I mean, there's, there's different forms of vitamin D and really what the, it's more the international units that matter versus worrying about whether it's D2 is, D2 I believe is more from a plant base and D3, I'm looking at, there's got to be a nutritional biochemist here. No. Um, D3 is more from the animal side, I believe. Am I wrong? I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't worry about that. I used to worry about it. And then the evidence really, it's more the international units that you're getting. Yeah. Yeah, you just want to make sure that they, they haven't expired. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, because the, the amount of vitamin, it's really, um, this is one of the issues in milk. It's really hard to get the right amount. They've got it better now, but that's why, like in England, they put too much D in, and then you got a whole bunch of modeling, so they took it out. So um, it's, uh, it can be toxic, but not, not at the levels we're talking about. So I apologize, I can't quite remember my biochemistry on that. Yeah. You want to focus on the person number four? Uh-huh. Yep. Well, I think it's really important. Um, personally, it's like, it's amazing. I look at myself and I was like, I don't like to do setups. <laughs> but it is the core, everything radiates out from the core. And so when we were doing the exercises with the, the women back here, and we've since done a number of different studies, we always have done trunk exercises. We were doing a back extension. Even with the double leg, we're getting at some pretty large core. So, and, and a lot of times people forget about the mid-back. You think of the lower back. So I'm a huge proponent. I think that the thing with core that is, is what I really try to encourage people to do is to come up with a five or 10 minute routine on the floor or against a wall, or, and you can look at them online. There's so many different ones. It's do one that you enjoy that's progressive enough that really gets at these muscles because it's amazing how little we use our core in our daily lives unless we really are chopping wood a lot or we're doing, we're, we're doing other manual work. So I think it's critical. Um, the problem is, is that they're I, I don't want to ever weigh one thing above another because if, uh, if you're then you're never going to go out for a walk, you know, I want you to also go out for a walk as well. But core, core activities, this is where I think Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates, there are a lot of different types of core exercises that are, are fun and enjoyable and really help to strengthen you. One more question and then I will release you for the evening. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for the Iowa nice welcome, thank you.